This panel is uh, tips and tricks for online conversion rates. And uh, before we get started, I'm going to just do a couple exercises here that are going to kind of set up the tone uh, for what we're going to talk about today. And so the first thing is just a show of hands, who leaves an email client open all day when they're working? All right. What about a Twitter client? Facebook? All right, so a lot of hands for all those. Uh, the point I'm trying to make there is we all multitask every day to some degree, usually with social networks, things like that. And uh, I don't think we're really aware of the amount of multitasking that we do. And we're not alone. Pretty much everyone who uses the internet now is a professional multitasker. But uh, there's something interesting about being a professional multitasker, and that is uh, that we all really suck at it. So a bunch of studies have been published over the last few years, the most notable of which uh, were done by Stanford and also one that was published on NPR. But basically, the results of these studies show that humans are OK with two concurrent processes, doing two things at once, uh, but only with an incentive. There's a caveat there. And whenever you introduce more things than two, people's performance goes into the dumpster very quickly. Okay, and that's a, that's a whole, what, the, the bottom line there is, is attention span and focus. We're easily fractured, easily put off course, not easily directed in, in one way. And uh, that's a fundamental concept with online conversion. It's focus and flow. And uh, so that's one, one concept, focus and flow. We're going to revisit this topic time and again throughout uh, this presentation. And then the next thing I want to share is an actual personal experience that I had that got me into online conversion uh, with my own website, uh, my DIY Themes website, my company site. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with my product, we sell a WordPress theme on there. And so we only have one product offering. And uh, I've got uh, a plans and pricing page where I spell out the options for what people are going to buy. Okay, it's uh, DIYthemes.com slash plans. And if you guys have an iPad or a, a laptop, you may want to use the URLs uh, on your own here because uh, the screen is limited resolution here. Um, but the bottom line is if you look at this plans and pricing page, I've got a, you know, a logo up at the top. I've got some navigation over here on the right. I've got a big headline. And you come down, you've got two links you can click on to buy, right? And then you scroll down, got some testimonials, big names using thesis. And then I've got some footnotes that don't do anything and that only link to the internal copy on the page. And then I've got a footer. Well, in this footer, I used to have a link to my affiliate program to sign up for the affiliate program, just a simple little innocuous link in the footer. And we were looking at the data on each of our pages, traffic data, conversion data, those kinds of things. And we noticed that that affiliate link on the bottom of this page had a 31% higher conversion than it did on any other page on the site. So we were looking at this, like, what is going on? Why is there such a disparity? And we got to looking, and it's because the, the, the link options on this page are very constrained. You can either buy, or you can click a nav, uh, navigation menu item, or get lost. So what people were doing was they were coming to this page, reading through all the things we had to give to them. We've presented them with an option. Now they have a choice. So they're thinking about that. They're reading, wanting to read more about the product, presumably, or look up any more information. They keep scrolling. They get here to the bottom. They're looking for anything that they can do, any action that they can take. The action we presented to them was a link in the footer. They all clicked on it, as evidenced by the 31% higher click-through rate on that link on that page. So to me, that was, that was a really, that was a poignant moment for me with, with regard to online conversion and kind of an epiphany moment because that right there illustrates the concept of focus and how necessary that is if you want to get conversions. You know, I presented basically a funnel here where people could read a very short list of things and then that option at the end, like they were even going to do one of two things on that page. They were either buying or clicking on that affiliate link. But that's really telling because that, that sets up the argument that, hey, maybe you can predict what the user is going to do, give them a very limited set of constraints, keep them on task and avoid the uh, pitfalls of multitasking and diversions and really help them focus on what you want them to do, which is buy your stuff. So in my opinion, that is the fundamental concept uh, beneath online conversion rates. You, your, your primary thought process has to involve thinking about what the user wants to do, what, where their mind might be, and facilitating them through that process of buying your stuff, keeping them on task, keeping them away from this scourge of 
want to click on anything else to divert their attention. So on that note, so I'm talking about the user's behavior, the user's psychology on your site. So if you are selling a product, uh, your website might look something like this. You might have a home page, and you might have a blog, and then you might have a series of other pages, maybe a, a tour, product tour, and about page, or something like that. And the thing that's interesting about that is that we, we, those of us who have products and sell them online, we're probably thinking about our sales pages a lot. You know, we're not totally dumb to the idea of conversion or blind to it. You know, we're doing certain things on those pages, and yet we might leave 80% of the pages of our site to be automatic output from WordPress or something like that, to where you have like a content and a sidebar, a bunch of links in the sidebar, a bunch of navigation links. You know, I might be on a product sales page, but there's, you know, 10 navigation choices and 50 more links in the sidebar. Now, after what we just heard in the very beginning of this talk, it seems very likely that people would be getting distracted by sidebar links and navigation links on pages. You know, if your goal is to have somebody sign up for a product and you've given them not only the information about that product, but 50 links and a bunch of navigation links, you know, you've just muddied your signal to the point where you can't really expect uh, really good results from something like that. So I'm gonna contest that there are three different types of user behaviors that you need to account for as you construct your entire site. There's only three types of users that you're gonna encounter when you sell a product online. That is uh, the user who is flirting. So this is kind of like, this is kind of like dating. Uh, the, the, the parallels are, are many, as we'll see. But you got the flirting stage where somebody just happens to your site, maybe through a search engine result or through a link or following something on Twitter, and they come to your site and they don't know anything about your product, right? And so for uh, conversion rate experts, people that do this you know, for clients, things like that, they will say that you need to have all of your pages focused around your five key benefits or your five key points, whatever your you know, unique proposition is, that that needs to be evident on any page of your site, like at the top, basically, because if these flirters come into your site through any means, they could come to any page, and if it's not clear what your message is, then you've basically lost a chance to sell. Okay, and like for my site, DIYThemes.com, we, we run a, a content blog and most of our traffic, incoming traffic, links and stuff, go to that. And right now, we're making a huge mistake because we don't have, I mean, we say that, you know, we sell thesis over, like, on the right-hand side or something, but we don't have a prominent thing just slapping people in the face saying, hey, this is what we do, these are the key benefits. So that's one, one area where, where I'm making a mistake, but basically, it's because I'm not treating all those as catch pages for these flirters, okay? Uh, so that's something important to think about. Dealing, uh, accommodating these people who are flirting, people who don't know squat about your product, is something that is gonna determine the overall direction of your site, the design of every single page. Because um, any time you're not accounting for flirters, you're giving up you know, potential prospects. So uh, let's see here. So basically, what, what does this mean about accommodating these flirters on every page? Uh, it means you need simple and clear navigation. Okay, you don't, you know, if somebody's trying to decipher your navigation, they're not, certainly not figuring out what the message of your product is or what you're trying to sell. So you, you want to, you know, present them with choices that are not going to confuse them, not going to overload them. So, you know, less is more, especially with regard to the navigation. Uh, like I said, you want to kind of spell out your five key points in an unmissable way, benefit-focused copy. And, uh, you know, basically your whole, like I said, your whole site should be designed around this central purpose. And, uh, the, the uh, saying I'm gonna use here is always be flirting. So make sure on each page that you are, are flirting appropriately if you want to garner the most prospects possible. Okay, so that's the first phase of user behavior on your site, the flirters. They don't know you, you don't know them, you're trying to make a positive introduction. The next phase is the information gathering phase. So these are users who are interested enough or savvy enough about your product that they have voluntarily chosen to click through to a product page a page explaining your product exactly what you're offering, presumably with copy and benefits and whatever else, guarantees, whatever else you might want to throw in there. So the information gathering phase, this is extremely important. I think this is where most uh, e-commerce websites break down woefully, uh, and that's because focus is, is so key here for the user and for you. And uh, I'm gonna introduce a, a concept called channeling intent, okay? so. Let's think about this. If you are looking at a product page, or a user has come to your site and is looking at a product page, their goal is to get information about that product. That is their primary goal. That is the user's intent. Your job as the website owner, if you want to increase conversions, is to channel that intent, to channel it effectively. So if I had a product page, let's say about iPod speakers, 
Okay, I've got iPod speakers on my site. And I sell three kinds of iPod speakers and I sell a bunch of other iPod stuff. Uh, if a user lands on this page and I show my speakers, and then over in the sidebar I show all my other uh, iPod accessory products because, you know, hey, I want to make sure they know everything that I sell, common sentiment, that's actually, I would say that that is not, that's, that's working against your channeling of intent. They're not looking for iPad accessories, they're looking for iPad speakers or iPod speakers. But uh, and so, so that's important to keep in mind on your, especially on your, on your product pages, I would say that imposes some pretty heavy constraints. You know, you don't want to go outside that intent of the user, but where that, that becomes powerful is that if I sell three different kinds of iPod speakers, then I do want to introduce those on that page. So that if I didn't get you with A, I might get you with B or C, but the whole time what's important is that you were never off task. You were always thinking about iPod speakers and what offerings I was giving to you. That's huge for uh, increasing conversions, and especially in that information gathering phase, that is where people get off track the easiest. Because it's a little bit of work to figure out something about a product, to make choices about what you might want to buy based on technical criteria. That's work. And if you want to get the best results, you are responsible for making sure that that user keeps their focus on that page. Makes a huge, huge difference. As, I mean, just uh, as the link on uh, the bottom of DOI themes there shows. You know, if you send their focus that direction, it will follow. And if you give them a chance to, to do something else, they'll do that too. All right, so that's the second phase of user interaction on your site. The third phase is the purchasing phase. So like you've made it through the flirting and the courtship, you're ready to seal the deal. Your job is not to screw this up. And so all the rules that I've said about like cl simple, clear navigation, not sending people off the path, this is all super magnified on a, a purchasing page. And I will show you ours real quick to, see, to show you what I mean. So if you click through from this page, which I already said had a limited number of links on it, you go to my purchase page, and you'll notice here the logo is no longer clickable. There is no navigation menu on the right. There are no links in the copy, none. This is a thing that does a JavaScript pop-up. And then you've got a purchase button. There's no escape. There's nothing. you got the back button. You can close your browser. You can buy my product. you got nothing. So. That is, that is an absolute funnel right there. And that's, a, you know, th this, when we made this change, uh, we experienced about a 20% increase in conversions on this page. And especially, we have a metric called dropouts, which is people who sign up for the product but don't actually pay for it. They never follow through. Dropouts also went down with this. I, I hypothesize because the user was more focused on what they were trying to do. So that's pretty key. So now, now we kind of have this, this, these ideas in mind where, we want the user to focus, and we have to cater to three different modes, three distinct modes of user behavior. And that's really going to determine the shape of our entire website. This is really powerful. Everything needs to be built around this purpose to really pull off the best possible conversion. So let's talk about that. If there's three different types of user interactions, I'm going to say there's three different types of web pages. You have pages where people are going to be primarily flirting, where you might be doing something like we're doing, like putting out uh, you know, blog posts to try and you know, gain trust in the community, uh, expand our reach on different topics, you know, in trying to provide some value. But at the same time, those pages are not selling effectively for us unless we employ the elements we need to flirt you know, with the people using those pages. So we've got the flirting kind of pages. Home pages are usually flirting pages as well. In my case, it's an information gathering page, the second kind of page, because that's really where I introduce my product. If you have multiple products, your home page is going to be a flirting page. So, now the information gathering pages, these are specific product pages. That's how you can view them. So let's say you have three products on your site. You have three really hardcore information gathering pages that you would need to focus on. And then the third kind of page is a purchasing page. And usually, you know, you have one form or something like that, one page on your site that handles uh, this third thing, the purchasing. So that's really a little bit easier to deal with. So let's look at the elements. Okay, so, so now that we know what pages we have to construct, let's look at the actual pages themselves and, and talk about the elements on those pages. So for instance, I'll uh, go back to the DIY Themes homepage here. Maybe. And so on, on any given page, you have primary elements and you have what I'm gonna call facilitators. So first we're gonna talk about primary elements and the primary elements on any page pretty much are gonna be your headline, okay, like I've got here at the top. And, Headlines to be most effective, you want to spell out a benefit. Ideally, you want to show how easy something is. So benefit, ease, you want to be specific, and then also believable. 
And so a lot of people try to get creative, too creative. That's the, the common flaw, is to be, try to be too creative or too cute with headlines, when really the user is discerning what you say, not really how you say it. So be clear, be concise, be distinct, you know, leave no doubt, but be persuasive. And then so the next, the next big element would be copy, body copy. All right, um, I've got a glut of copy beneath the fold here. So anyway, you've got your copy. Copy should always be benefit focused, not feature laden. Like I'm making this mistake right now, I talk about a bunch of features in my product that people probably don't care about on my homepage, it's a fail. I need to be talking about directly benefit focused copy. And then uh, uh, one thing that people usually make the mistake with, the most common mistake with copy on the internet is like people worried about having everything above the fold uh, worried about catering to that user who reads in very staccato style scanning, not really reading all the copy. And the problem with that is that for the people who are, for decisive people, decisive people know if they're going to buy your product. Indecisive people are going to gather as much data as they can and then crunch that data, possibly to their own anguish, and, and then try to make a decision. And if you do not overcome all likely objections to your product in your copy, while you might be getting the people who already decided they were going to buy, you're really hurting yourself with these people who are indecisive. So you definitely want to overcome all likely objections, which takes time to spell out and copy, but at the same time you want to be concise and persuasive. And so I said you want to be concise and you want to overcome all likely objections. So those thing, two things might be at odds. It might take a little bit of talking to overcome all the objections. Uh, but you want to be concise, so what do you do? The, the mantra is that most sites don't have enough copy. And uh, just as a mnemonic device here, I'd encourage you to think about those one column landing pages, those god awful ugly things that like these scammy video marketers and stuff want you to buy. Those pages, you know, they're a mile long. Copy, I mean, for days. And you think, how does this work? And yet you hear on internet marketing forums and stuff like that that these are the most, the highest converting kinds of pages. What, the, what is that about? Well, two things. Focus, there's usually no links in those pages. It's a direct stream of copy the user's like eye tracking pattern on a one column layout is directly down the page. That is incredibly efficient and focused. And, uh, and it's long copy because they're, they're overcoming all likely objections. They're consistently trying to persuade you to buy that product. You know, they're kind of uh, pacifying you and then rubbing your back a little bit like, okay, we're over this, now you can buy this, you know, trying to, trying to gain comfort. So, the, you know, overcome all likely objections. Don't be afraid to run your copy long because uh, you know, don't, don't worry about above the fold and all that stuff. You need to tell your story, give yourself enough space to do that. Now, there's some tricks you can employ with your body copy and all that stuff to be more effective. Um, I st I'm, I'm still referring to these as primary elements of your page, not facilitators, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So a couple more would be picture captions. Picture captions and also subheadlines, like subsection headings, you follow me? Like little breaks in the text with, with, with larger text. Those things on the site, those elements, tend to be read more than twice as much as the copy. So those are times when you can spell out benefits in a concise manner to try and catch people. It's kind of like the flirters where you want to make sure you present something to them. You want to present something in these high impact visible locations that are going to kind of encourage people to buy. Captioning is really, really great. Think about it when you read the newspaper, back when we had newspapers. Uh, I remember as a kid, I was, always, I was just reading the captions and headlines and looking at pictures. And, uh, you know, studies show time and again, usability tests, that people are reading captions, subheadlines, headlines, and the tagline on your site, and not much else. All right, the next thing uh, is something called callouts, um, or violators, as marketers like to say. And so this is a little bit uh, more nonlinear, but this site, like, that we're looking at right here is very much, uh, it's very linear. It's very vertical and very horizontal. There's nothing, there's no diagonal elements. But anything, so, you know, the primary lines are, are vertical and horizontal. If there are any elements that are, you know, violating that, like possibly something coming in at a diagonal, those things are going to arrest the user's attention immediately. And, you know, these are areas where you want to either espouse a benefit, throw out a guarantee, things of that nature. You know, those are high visibility locations. Use those effectively. You know, use those rather than just putting them there and not really understanding why you're doing that. And then the other two primary elements are forms, which are really only going to occur, hopefully, on your purchasing page. And then action buttons, which are, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a site that does action buttons really well, 37 Signals. They do all kinds of testing on their click-throughs and stuff like that. And so, like, their button here says see plans and pricing, and then they also do a risk aversion thing right there. 
and then for people who are interested, they offer a link to, you know, a, a tour of their product. So with action buttons, you know, that's another opportunity to talk about a guarantee. Um, also, this is huge. When you have buttons or anything, links, anything like that in your sales process, so if it's something on a product page, purchase page, whatever, any action buttons that you employ, you, you have to be aware that you are setting up a very clear expectation for the user. And this is a theme that, that occurs throughout conversion stuff. You have to be aware of the expectations you have set forth because not delivering on them will ensure that you lose a significant number of sales. So you have to be clear what messages or you know, signals and stuff you're sending to the user and that you follow through with them. And so something like this, see plans and pricing, well, by God, I better see plans and pricing when I click on that link. By the same token, if you say download software here and the next page, like I do, and the next page is a form, you might piss some people off. I don't even like that. I can't believe I just said that. But, uh, you know, that, that's something you have to be cognizant of is these expectations that you are setting up all the time on your site. Okay, and so those are primary elements. So I'll rehash those. It was the headline, the body copy, captions and subheadings, you know, things, interstitial things inside the text that are more visible, and then the call-outs, violators, uh, forms, and action buttons. Those, those, are, those are your primary elements. Stick to those, and you've got pretty much enough to sell. There's a few things that I'm calling facilitators that you also need to really be able to sell online. Those, there's things like adding social proof, testimonials, how many people you bought this product or whatever. Uh, you know, you can use uh, social graph tools like Facebook Like to say, you know, eight of your fr friends bought this product. You know, things like that, those are facilitators. They're going to help people make a decision. Uh, guarantees, guarantees, I mean, you don't have to have a guarantee. Some products it's not befitting, but you know, risk aversion tactics like having a guarantee, huge, huge for conversion, especially when they're rehashed right around action buttons. When the user is going to take action, you assuage them right there, say, hey, you're going to get the guarantee, don't worry. That helps click throughs on buttons. You know, it helps the whole process along by reassuring people every time they're going to take action. You know, people like to be told, hey, yeah, you're doing the right thing. And this is one way you can do that, even though you don't get to interact with them directly. Another thing would be using SSL, Secure Socket Layer, HTTPS. If you have people filling out data on your forms, people are very sensitive about what information they give out to whom. And uh, if you have a Secure Socket Layer, HTTPS connection, uh, people who are the least bit savvy are usually assuaged by something like that. And that's, that's another facilitator. Another one would be a lock icon. Seems trivial, but this actually helped us out too. This upped our conversion a little bit when we stuck uh, a lock icon, like a security icon, right next to the, uh, the buy button, or pretty close to it anyway. I'll get there. So in this yellow box, see we got this lock. Users are accustomed, uh, user conditioning, another big deal on the internet. You know, users are accustomed to seeing these kinds of things where they check out. They're also accustomed to seeing what kind of payment options you offer. So if you don't, if you don't have simple, you know, simple informative pieces of data like this around your action buttons, you might be missing out on clicks there too, just because some people are uncertain. And then uh, another facilitator would be something like a live chat. I see a lot of this, and I've, I've uh, have some friends using this on their sites. You know, a little live chat indicator in the lower right hand corner. You've probably seen these things. Uh, apparently, those really help too, because people oftentimes just like uh, being in the gym, lifting weights, and needing a spotter. People just need the slightest nudge. The slightest nudge. And that's what all these things are about, these facilitators, element placement, all those things. It's about giving them that slight nudge that they need. And you know, you're in charge of your business. You need to figure out what, the, what tools are the nudge tools for you. But uh, you always want to be thinking about that. What can we do to nudge these users over the, you know, bring them into the fold? And uh, all right, so there's another thing there that's not related to the structure of the pages specifically, and that is well, what is the nature of the offer itself that you are offering? Like, what are you trying to sell? So in my case, I have one product, but you'll notice I have two pricing options, like a lower price and a higher price one, developer and personal. And two options is better than one. The rule is this, two options are better than one, three options are better than two, but two is better than one because the question doesn't become, should I buy this? It becomes, which one should I buy? Psychological framing, another thing you, you want to do, you know, if you're flirting with people, you ideally want to psychologically frame it so they feel like they have to have your product or something like that, you know, make it a need rather than a want. Uh, but, you know, that's super, that's super important to do. And to have, but to have one, two, or three offers is great. Uh, three is even better psychologically because it's, it's which one should I buy and how can I get the best deal, which people seem to like asking that question of themselves and then coming up with a solution. 
But to have any more than three is absolute folly, in my opinion. I see, I see a lot. I see a lot of companies offering like five different levels of uh, recurring pricing levels. And I assume that they haven't read uh, the book How We Decide by a guy named Jonah Lehrer who writes for Wired Science. And uh, in this book, this guy really spells out in, in detail what humans are really capable of doing as far as deciding among options. And it turns out we are all abysmally poor and usually uh, have some level of anxiety over choosing between five or more things. Like it's a disaster. Our cognitive reasoning and stuff, it just goes into the toilet uh, when you even approach the number five. So that's why three or two offerings is kind of the magic number uh, because you don't want to confuse people. You don't want to make them, you know, they don't want to have to work too hard to think about buying your stuff. You want it to be easy. So fewer options makes that easier. All right. Uh, so we pretty much covered the basics, and I think, I think it's helpful to illustrate these topics by actually looking at some pages that you guys have out there in the wild, maybe doing kind of a site clinic thing and actually looking at pages, identifying elements and saying we could do this better, that better, or whatever. Uh, I, I, I learned well that way, and I think, uh, I think it'll be well suited to this. So uh, looking for brave volunteers who have product-oriented websites and like product pages, purchase pages with forms, things of that nature. Actually, I'll, 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 I got ahead of myself. I want to make one point about forms, and then we'll do that. So about your purchase form, I wanted to make a special exclusion for this. Um, on your purchasing page, it's very important, oh, actually two, two points, about eye tracking. Knowing where users' eyes are going to go first and making sure that you are putting hard-hitting things in those locations. So on any page, the first place a user's eye goes instinctively is to the upper left quadrant of the page. Generally speaking, companies will put logos and taglines up there, which is one thing that contributes to taglines being one of the most read things on any website. Uh, so you want to you have something up there towards the top, and immediately after they go to the top left, they look to a headline, like in this case, the headline centered, so the eye tracking would probably start here, drop a little bit over here, these would be heat zones, and then the eye would go to the left. And there's various reasons for that. Um, I'm very into typography and I've done a lot of uh, research on that and testing, stuff like that, since about 2007. And typography is very closely tied to eye tracking. You can actually determine a user's path down the page simply by determining where the left edge of text is. It's the flush left edge of your text. And you can influence users' eyes to go directly there. Like we naturally, like when we pick up a book page to start reading, our eyes are going to go to the upper left corner, stick on that, that flush left edge, and bam, that's where we're anchored. Okay, so thinking about this as a user, you don't really want somebody looking at your page and then having eye tracking where they're like going back and forth across the page in a cumbersome manner, like, you know, they're looking at all kinds of things. That's hard to do. It's much easier to go in a top-down, direct format and just be, it's flow. I mentioned that earlier, focus and flow. Top-down is the best flow on the internet. It's a natural thing to scroll. It goes straight down. It's not really natural to, to have your gaze go back and forth left to right. Now, with that said, that means you want to put hard-hitting stuff in the upper left, uh, you want to have a good headline, and then you want to make sure you know, that you keep pe people focused on that copy that you want them to read, and not by giving them a bunch of like, images and stuff out to the right. Like, I'm, here, here's some mistakes I'm making on my homepage right here. Uh, we look at mine, I've, got, I've established a left-right thing at the top already, like that's kind of breaking their, their flow and their focus. And then down here, I've got a bunch of copy on the left, but on the right, I've actually got images of people, big time people using my software. And that stinks too, because people are reading the copy. They're not, their eyes aren't bouncing over there. And if they are bouncing over there, then they're not reading the copy. So I'm like fighting myself here. You have to be aware of things like that with the user's visual flow. You wanna, you wanna make it easy for them. Make it easy for the user. I mean, that is a theme that should run throughout your business. You want your product to be easy for the user. You want your site to be easy for them. Everything should be easy. All right, and then we go to the form, the purchase form, which is the most important piece of this puzzle regarding flow and user direction, eye tracking. So like this, this is actually a terrible form. It's concise. When I first built it, I was like, oh, that's cool. There's not too many blanks there. It's not imposing. But the problem with it is it, it, it does the left-right thing. So user looks here, then looks here. Then looks here, then looks here. And they get a look at this. It's like two fields. They're not labeled, oh, your first and last name. People screw this up all the time. I can't tell you how many times people put the exact same information in both fields, don't know what to, like, put their whole name in one field. Like, you know, if, if, if you give them the opportunity to make a mistake, they will make it, especially as your business grows. I can promise you that. So here, the, the ideal thing would be to have, you know, this form field, it should say first name above it, top down. You introduce it, then you bring the element. 
If people need additional directions, like let's say email address. I've got a form labeled email address, and then I want to say, well, we will never sell your email address to anybody. We hate spam as much as you do. Most people would put that underneath. Like they would have your email here, then the form box, and then the description underneath. Well, the user starts at the top, looks at the field, sees there's text, goes down, reads that text, and goes back up to the field. Visually, that's not as smooth as just introducing the description above the field and making sure they just maintain that top-down flow. It gives them less chance to get off task and get distracted. Uh, so key. Most people, when they get off track once, you lost them. Look at it that way. Never, lose, let, never let them lose track. Be very possessive of that. So really, all these form fields, you get the idea. The, the label should be atop the field. Any descriptive information should follow the label. Then the form field should follow that. And it should all be presented in a top-down format without regard to the scrolling of the page because you are determining the user's visual flow. You know, even if there's nothing out to the right and the, the CEO doesn't like that, well, too bad. Nobody's looking there. And you can prove that. So there we go about the flow. Now we're ready to talk about some of your alls' pages. So I saw some hands back there. Yeah, all the way in the back. Is that right? I think it is. Well, what? Somehow, I managed to do that. All right. Okay. So I see three, four options there. Are they all the same product? Because the one on the far right has a different logo and it looks like something else. Okay. So right there, you've got four offers. I do like, I mean, you've taken a page out of the 37 Signals book, I assume, here, and identified a most popular option. That's good. That's something I mentioned earlier, a facilitator to help users decide. That's a great facilitator, showing them what's popular, suggesting something. Especially when you have a lot of technical data for somebody to parse, it's doubly important that you suggest something. Because sometimes people don't understand all those numbers and maybe not sure what the consequences may be if they choose a two gigabyte plan versus a four. You know, that, in, in cases like that, it's, it's vitally important to add some facilitator there to help them make a decision. Let's see here. So you got all this stuff at the top, like register, chat, login, browse, uh, all this stuff. I mean, everything basically above those offers, go on on this page. The only thing you want to maintain, always maintain form of your site. Like if the logo is in the upper left, do not move that logo just because it's a payment page. Make sure that that is consistent for the user. The viewport should be consistent. When they open a page, elements should roughly be in the same location. But you can add and remove things that will. Like on your purchase page, you know, don't have navigation. Don't let them click elsewhere. Keep them on task. And so, you know, by offering all these other links, they're like, well, should I join him? Should I look at his other stuff? Should I sign up for his email or should I buy his product? What do you want him to do? Right. So, yeah, I would say that's not clear enough in this case. Uh, they recommend, um, just like we saw on the 37 Signal site with like the, the guarantee placed directly underneath the action button, you'd want to do the same. You'd want to present your options and then directly beneath that say, hey, not sure yet, see what other people are saying about it. Okay. Uh, real quick, just a quick uh, side here. Um, sign up and submit are, are, are not uh, favorable copy for buttons. People feel like when they're signing up for something, they might be signing up for something, they like, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe you're going to give, like, what am I signing up for? That's also uh, signing up. I mean, I realize you have a recurring billing service, and signing up is something that is more akin to subscription-based models. And so sometimes that throws people off. They feel like they're signing up. Well, am I doing this all the time, or am I just buying it once? You know. Clarity, and uh, you know you want to you want to leave no doubt for the user. So uh, it can be that. What what happens when they click on this this button? Where are they taken next? PayPal. What? PayPal. Taking to PayPal. So maybe uh, you know have have your button copy be whatever it is, and maybe a little thing underneath that you get this guarantee, and you're going to be sent to PayPal to complete your payment on the next step. Set up an expectation, deliver clearly. People love it. Uh, there's a famous copywriter named Gary Halbert. And he's uh, reached notoriety basically because he was so specific in his, his copywriting letters. One famous one is that he was selling, helping a Rolls Royce dealership or something in Miami sell more cars. And he sent out a letter to all their former customers. 
and said to call, like it was like, uh, call into the, you know, the auto store or whatever, and you're going to speak to a lady named Karen. She's going to be wearing a blue sweater. She's going to be very sweet to you, and she's going to set you up. These people call up. They talk to Karen. Karen's wearing a blue sweater, and they love that. They, he set up clear expectations for them, and they just took it hook, line, and sinker, followed right through because, you know, he was trustworthy. So, and then you've got a comparison of features. Feature comparisons are really good for the reason I mentioned earlier, facilitators, helping people choose between technical data that might be overwhelming. Um, a rule of thumb, if you, if you differentiate your product on more than five levels, like if you offer three different levels of one product and there's high levels of differentiation, like one gets eight more features than another one, uh, I caution you there, don't go above five differences. It's too much cognitive stuff for people to juggle. They can't make those kinds of decisions. If you are going to do that, for some reason it's completely necessary, you should offer a chart like, like he's done and, and help them make that decision, knowing that they don't have the cognitive resources to actually do it and feel comfortable about that decision. Let's see here. Got anything at the bottom? Then you got all these footer links. I'd say nuke. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you got recent press. What I would do with the recent press, since those are big brand names, I would just say that we've gotten press from these people, put it on this page, you know, somewhere near where people sign up, and just don't make them linked. You say you got press from them. People may not read that. They may just see the logos and think, hey, New York Times likes this guy. I'm on. So, you know, it's a little underhanded, but not really. All right, got any other, uh, how about, a, how about a, a purchasing form? You got a purchase form? Oh, yeah. Study aids? Man, I can't use this keyboard. Okay, I'm gonna look at this real quick. What's the difference between purchase now and registration? I said, what's the difference between purchase now and registration? You've been doing split testing on that? Okay. Actually, that's one thing I should mention. I haven't said that. The, the, the main mantra here is to implement these strategies and then test your butt off. Test, test, test. Uh, the tool that most people that I know are using right now is uh, simply Google Analytics. has some A-B uh, testing tools. Uh, I've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. My friends at backupify.com are using that pretty much to determine their whole site. Uh, they like it. It's good enough for a venture-funded company. We, we've had some success with it, so I think it's pretty good. There's another one called... Uh, Visual Website Optimizer by a company named Wingify. And then Timothy Ferris endorses that. So, I mean, he's used that for his conversion copies, stuff like that. So those are the two prominent ones. You definitely want to split test, though. Make sure you do. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about conversion is that you can be the biggest conversion rate expert on the planet, but those people will be the first to tell you that every case is different. There's always some kind of idiosyncrasy related to the business. Uh, and that, that's up to you to figure out. That's your, your goal is really to figure out those nuances about your sales funnel. All right, so back, back to the question at hand here. We're on your product page and looking at what we got here. So quite a few options with radio buttons. More than three. I'm already feeling a little overwhelmed. And that first option of none is setting up a negative psychological circumstance, in my opinion. Because the first thing they encounter is none. I don't want anything. Done. <laughs> back. Uh, Basically, you have to understand that you're coddling their psychology at all times. So you want to put them in a positive place to buy mentally and never discourage that. Uh, a lot, what a lot of companies will do, you know, the, we've all heard about the freemium model where you have a free service, but you have some paid stuff. You hope like 5% of the people pay so you don't lose your ass. Uh, a lot of savvy premium, freemium companies will have their uh, product page presented much like Timothy's. Like we saw, they have like five options. And they'll have a very obscure link underneath that to the free version. Uh, so I would say, if you, like, just for this, like, instead of having it first, I'd put that very last and possibly in smaller, you know, less authoritative text than the rest of it. Because ideally, you want people to buy your stuff, right? Not to be using your free services and leeching. I like the top-down format of that. People are always uh, with radio buttons. That's what these are called, these little circles that you can click on. 
Um, like SEO Moz does this with theirs, or did, they keep changing their doggone sales page. But they, they present them horizontally and rather than vertically top down. And like I said, that's kind of fighting the user's flow. Just a little bit. I mean, you could have a page that's only set up to go left to right, and then it's pretty freaking obvious. But generally speaking, stick to convention. Convention also is something that is good for sales. If you follow convention, like I said earlier, users have uh, train, they're trained to expect certain things on certain pages, user conditioning. Users are conditioned for, for normal websites. You know, if you have some kind of outlandish design with some crazy thing, uh, you're selling, and that's probably terrible. I've seen, I've seen some companies do this uh, in my marketplace. They have side-scrolling sites that scroll left to right because they think they're fancy because all the other websites scroll top down. Well, a lot of users can't even figure that out. They're like, what does this do? And they can't figure it out, and they leave. Fail. So it's great art. Can't sell, for, can't sell at all. So SEO mods, like I said, they've got, the, they've got their stuff situated left to right, but they do have three options, which is the, highest, the best converting psychological circumstance there. They've got button copy, try it now, risk free. They, the next page they get set up, you know, they're registering. Uh, no minimum term, cancel any time. They got a facilitator on there. They got VeriSign secured, another facilitator. Um, and then they also have another great sales technique that helps conversion, and they have a special offer there at the bottom. There's two ways to skin this cat. One way that people screw up is that you can offer a coupon form. And if you, have, if you show a coupon form to every buyer, you're probably going to lose a bunch of buyers because if, if I'm getting ready to sign up, I do this. A lot of people do this. If I see a coupon form, I'm searching for a coupon. Why should I pay full price? And that's what all your users are thinking. So be very careful when you use couponing. And this is the really smart approach to that. This turns it on its head. And they have a special offer where you can you know, prepay up front and give them like $600. And, or you know, now they have an option. So now not only... Have you presented three sales options up top, like which SEO Moz is right for me, not am I going to buy this? Now they're even hit with a special offer. So if they were the least bit inclined to do it, now they realize they can maybe get a deal. That is a psychological upper hand that SEO Moz has on the sales page. So whereas you, you've given the hand to the customer by showing them a, a coupon field, you could reclaim it with a strategy like this. So I think that's pretty interesting. All right, uh, let's see. So we've seen, we haven't, well, I mean, we haven't seen a product page. Let's see uh, an actual product page spelling out the exact benefits of a product. The Curio Cabinet Store. The Curio Cabinet Store? All right. Also, just uh, so you can be thinking about this, if anyone has an example of what they know of as like a good catch for flirting pages, like a blurb at the top of a page that spells out the benefits or, or things that your company offers or products, uh, I'd like to see an example of that. I actually couldn't find a good example of that. So if you guys have one, that'd be great. All right, so now we're, we're looking at this here. Um, what kind of product page should I go to here? Oh, I see. Gotcha. Didn't realize that. All right, so... Okay, this is an interesting scenario because this is more Amazon style, Amazon being a big box retailer with a bunch of items that they sell. Uh, you know, or, or something like an Ikea or an Amazon, they, they have so many different product categories that it, you want people to access these, be able to access these other product categories, I mean, presumably. But, you know, when you're on these particular sales pages, you know, then people think maybe, maybe I want other stuff. Because, you know, they've got all these links over here on the left. Maybe this is what I want. May, you know, the people who really want that, the information gatherers with intent, are going to be focused over here. But you may even lose some of them because there's elements available to distract them. Uh, so you've got different types here, a few different links. Uh, I think that the setup of these pictures and stuff doesn't really facilitate flow at all. It's kind of, it's not really clear what the user should be doing there in this, in this curio section or whatever. And then like these, uh, I mean, unless somebody has prior knowledge of these brands, like I wouldn't know what to click on. I might be looking for cabinets, but how is somebody to, to know like what might possibly, you know, be, uh, suit, suit their taste without having to delve through everything? So, I mean, your job with a site like this is, is it's tough to do. You have a ton of products. It's very hard to make sure that you tailor made every page to be exactly what it should be, especially when you're dealing with a bunch of distributors. Like, you got a ton of products. Hard to do. Um, it's much easier when you have a limited number. But 
I do think that um, more constraints might be necessary, maybe narrowing it down to not being able to look at all curio cabinets or, or having a landing page for your cabinets that sets up like you might be looking for this type or you know, then we suggest these manufacturers. If you're looking for this type, you know, something to, something facilitative that will help people traverse that site or make decisions. Because to me, this looks like you're just thrown in there and maybe just gonna look through a whole shop. And some people do that, like I know a bunch of ladies that like to go to thrift stores and look through every rack, but I'm not looking through anything. Uh, well, you can assume, okay, this is a great thing. This goes back to channeling intent, like I said earlier. You can bet you're behind that if somebody's on a curio cabinet page that they're probably looking for curio cabinets, but there's probably a zillion different kinds, modern, traditional, contemporary, you know, it could be anything. And so at that point, that's when I would want to find out, well, what is your intent further? We know you want this, perhaps you want this, rather than just giving them a glut of options and hoping they figure it out. Because if, if you are not clear enough, Google's just one click away. They might find something else that's a little easier for them to digest and parse. Oh yeah, I do see that. No, that's good, that's constrained. It keeps them in that category. It goes back to the iPod speaker thing I said earlier. You know, they're looking for speakers, show them other kinds of iPod speakers, but nothing outside of that. Yeah, I mean, the filters and stuff are good when you have big inventory. I forgot, I mean, I, I've normally focused on smaller inventory stuff to prepare this, but uh, bigger inventory stores offering filters, very uh, good filters for allowing people to narrow down the range of products that they're looking at. That's extremely important. Uh, I've never run a, a site with a ton of products, but I've been told that that uh, is the primary determinant in raising their conversion, is figuring out smart filtering and making that easy for users to use. You've got all this stuff here on the left. It would probably be better to put it at the very top. Because like the goal of this page should be to figure out exactly what they want and to send them in that direction, to channel their intent. And so it may behoove you not to have that stuff on the left. Like, you know, like if you want to filter by height here, you gotta go all the way down to the bottom. Maybe people aren't gonna get there. Don't assume that somebody's motivated enough to look for stuff on your site. You you should be trying to determine their psychological state at every point on your site. You want to manipulate them really. All right, so you got an example of a good flirt page. Admired opinions. Okay, yeah, sweet. I mean, your your whole catch here is this is a, this is a great example of um, copy and layout done well for people who are flirting and come here. I don't know squat about this, but now I do. All the information you need right, is right here. They've spelled out four key benefits, which is wonderful. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. Pre-screen legitimate paid surveys, and then they, you know, why is this, this is, this is a great tactic to, to pose a question to people, you know, people have read through this, they've introduced their product, people still might have questions, they set up a question. Uh, I don't see anything here that's, that's linkable, but you know, put, put your action links right next to the copy that is associated with them if you want the highest click through on those actions. But this is a great way to set it up. This is very, this is very good. Um, things like that, I mean, that's really gonna help. I, I wish I had more data personally about this so I could say, oh, this is so great, this is what it did for me. Uh, we have not employed that uh, effectively on DIYthemes.com yet, but I suspect that we will see an increase, especially since we've rolled out a content strategy and are trying to funnel people in through our blog when we have those benefits espoused on that page, I suspect we will see an increase. Oh, I'll make one point real quick. Whenever you include pictures, uh, especially on product or sales pages, make sure that the, the line of sight of the people in the picture is looking at your copy. So I, I can't tell you how many times people put a face on there and they're looking the other way and humans instinctively will look at where people are looking if they see another human in a picture. So that's just another little eye tracking tip there. If you want people to read copy, throw a picture of a person looking right at it and that is a facilitator for that. All right, so scrolling down here. I mean, these are pretty good. It, it, basically, this is a pretty clever way of what I said earlier in your body copy, you want to remove all potential objections that the user might have for buying your product. And what they've done here is, you know, are paid surveys actually for real? You know, some people ask, is this really legitimate? This is one way that they're fighting that. 
and they're having them take an action to do that, to figure that out, that weds them to the process, makes them feel a little more involved. That's another great tactic there. Um, you know, they, they talk more about their service here. This is basically body copy with an actionable twist. Um, I'm curious, you know, you're, having, you're sending people through these surveys. Have you noticed that once they activate that survey that your, your conversion rate becomes higher because you've gotten them actively involved in a process on the site? Yeah, the only thing that concerns me about this is you have convinced them maybe to, to make this click, but don't undervalue a single click on your site. Like, it is a big deal to get somebody to click in a directed place, okay? And so if you're sending that to some place where they can go play and maybe not really be as directed as they were before, that might be working against you. Only you can know that by testing. You know, I could say that, but it doesn't matter. This guy? Oh, that's cool. Keeping it on the page is good. Interesting. Thought I had a point there from the bottom. I don't know what it was. All right, has anyone got any questions about anything? Anything you want me to, to, to look at here? Um, anything like that about your own sites? All righty. So you got what, seven links in that navigation menu? Got a shopping cart, got the phone number. Phone number is real good. Anything, any contact you can provide. Um, I, I've been told that having the number right next to an action button converts better or like helps people out. You want to place that around like, Ideally, you come in and say, hey, you can contact us right at the point when they say, oh, I got a question. And so they're probably going to have a question further down in your copy and then have to scroll back up to see that. So it might not be as effective as it would be otherwise. Uh, I haven't tried that yet, but that might be a good tactic to try. All right, did you have any specific questions about the setup? In, in the upper right? Uh, that's debatable. I think there's really a few good ways you can go about it. The, the one I see most commonly is one that's fixed in the lower right position of the scroll of the active window, so that no matter how the user scrolls, they see this little thing in the lower right hand corner. Where that could be a problem is if you have an information dense layout from left to right, and you got that thing's like blocking stuff that you might want them to see. Um, that brings up uh, segues into another great point, and that is you have to really consider your layout. A lot of people have three column layouts and stuff like that, and you may not really know why. You might just prefer it, but that's kind of irrational, right? It needs to fit your purpose. And if you offer somebody three columns, think about the fact that you're inviting them to look in three separate horizontal places. You're like pretty much saying flow is out the window. And you know, be cognizant that th those things might be working against your goal. And I would almost say if you, can, if you are selling products, you should really try to have as, you know, try to, try to make it a one column deal if you can. Or, or at least use two columns in such a way that, that you're not distracting them and, and, giving, and giving them an invitation to click away from the page should they get you know, off your flow path that you've intended for them. Can you look at the shopping cart? Yeah. Yeah, uh, where, where's the product page? I can just, oh, there we go. Can I buy this by clicking on that? That's good. Also, if you have images of your products, images of your products, make those on product pages, on product pages only, make those clickable to your 
your fall through. People always think, assume images are going to be uh, clickable. So in usability tests, people will mouse over images, whether or not they're clickable is immaterial. They have attempted to see if it's clickable, and many people will take an action there, you know, onward. And that's why you want to have a caption to go with that image, ideally, that helps, you know, set up an expectation after the click. All right, so I added that to cart. I guess now we're at its cart. Okay, so this is a canned deal, though, is it not? This is like OS Commerce or something. What uh, what what software is this to to run your cart? WordPress. Well, I mean, for the whole site, but the cart's not WordPress. It's like, okay, all right. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. This is this is typical e-commerce stuff. I'd say this is probably good because this is what users expect. They are conditioned to see forms like this to represent a cart. So even if it breaks some of the little rules that we've talked about today, convention pretty much trumps everything. Because I mean, I think about, I think my grandfather, who's 82 years old, uses the internet. He, if he sees familiar things, he knows what to do. If not, he asks me. And so if it's familiar, they'll know what to do, even if it's a little little wonky. But this looks fine to me. Well, okay, so basically this, this is a social proof thing on the right, but it's for the brand. It's way more powerful to have very specific things. Like, yeah, he should definitely remove all the stuff on the right. However, he can introduce similar elements to this if they are related to the product itself. Showing social proof for this purchase is huge, super powerful. I mean, I would love to be able to say that, you know, eight of, show a thing that says eight of my Facebook friends just bought this in the last, you know, two weeks or something like that. That's awesome. Uh, also, um, attaching some element of scarcity without being a liar to offers is a big deal. Make it seem like people ha have some kind of urgency to act, and that, that magnifies the effect of you setting up a really good flow on a page. If they feel it's urgent and are able to complete a task, like, oh, they did it, and they, they had to buy from you. Uh, that's, that's, again, the psychological upper hand that you can establish there. If you have some kind of offer that expires or something like that. Um, one thing that I haven't seen done that seems like a good idea is like, let's say you're gonna offer a sale over a weekend. It's gonna be a three day sale. And then, uh, you know, on the last day, have like a countdown timer on that page, on, on the purchase page, you know, give them some sense of urgency. And people will, you know, r r uh, behave accordingly. Um, some, something about those studies I mentioned earlier about the multitasking studies, they showed that people's results went up dramatically. Their ability to multitask got better as incentives were applied. Um, monetary incentives were decent, uh, the best incentives were life and death, survival kind of things. And what they found, uh, it's, it's really funny, uh, a friend of mine, Danger Brown, mentioned to me that he used to work as uh, an emergency dispatch operator. He said it would be like hell in there sometimes because they'd have three phones ringing off the hook. You know each situation's probably very important. Response time's critical. He's got to figure out logistics. That's a high-pressure multitasking environment. And what they find is that people in those cases do a better job of multitasking than people not in those, those situations. So if you give people an incentive, a motivation to do a good job, they will focus and do a better job. So just one more thing you can do to facilitate that flow and focus. All right, well, where are we on time? I think we're pretty close to 4.30, but let's do a question. What do you think about uh, Digital on Okay, so I did a fair amount of reading about that this past week, and I've seen two conflicting opinions. I've seen internet marketer types. Uh, I don't know if that phrase rings too true with, with many of you, but people who try to sell information products that don't really have actual products, but they call them products, uh, a little spammy in my opinion, they love video, okay, love it, swear by it. They think it's the hot thing, like if you don't have video, how can you sell? I think there's some element of truth to that because people want to feel personally connected to the people from whom they buy, but I think that because that's been a popular thing, people have gone video crazy, and most people do it poorly, and so it's an attention thing. It's like, unless your video is completely tailored to your message, you know that the copy in that video and everything is, is like directing people, like flirting, they're introducing people to your product and then pushing them in an information gathering direction or a purchasing direction, unless you are very certain that, it's, that you have done a great job of that in the video, I'd say make that something that either they can view alternatively or, or something like that. I wouldn't lead with it because it's really easy for people to get distracted while viewing videos. Most people never finish videos that they start. If you get bored for even a couple seconds in a video, you're clicking off elsewhere. Whereas if you're forcing somebody to read through copy and everything, they, you know, it's a pretty clear task. Like they're gonna read through to the end. It's much harder to like get bored reading a paragraph and decide you're gonna quit. It's far less likely that somebody's gonna bail that way 
than it is if the, if the video is a little boring in a, in a, you know in one spot. So while video might get you the best conversion rate you've ever seen, it might also be working against your goals there. Um, I'm actually going to get ready to test that. I've had a video up on my homepage for well over a year now, and we're going to remove that and and do like what 37 Signals did, and they have you know intros to their products and images, they're not giving people the chance to waste their time with a video. And also, if you do have a video, make sure it plays on that page or in a pop-up window on that page so people never navigate away from the page. Should go without saying, but it's another thing. Also, um, conversionrateexperts.com, I highly recommend this article. Uh, it's conversion-rate-experts.com slash, /r well, I mean, just go to conversionrateexperts.com or you can search for 108 tips on that site, and you'll, you'll come to this article that they have that's 108 tips for website conversion. Much of the material that I got today was derived from these guys, these, these guys rule. They actually did SEO Moz's original sales page that tripled their business or something outrageous, and they, they have 108 great points. It's pretty much reminders of all the stuff we talked about today. I expounded upon them a little bit, but you know the meat is pretty much on that page, which would be good for you guys to refer to. But they say, that they only like to use video in testimonials. They say this, testimonials are most powerful in the following order. Video testimonials, testimony, uh, words with a picture, an image of the person saying that, and then just the testimonial with a name, followed by anonymous testimonials being the least effective. So in that order, top down, if you can garner video testimonials, play those videos on that page, that's extremely powerful video. I would say unequivocally, if you can get customer videos, you know, espousing your product, you do that. Huge. Um, 37 Signals uses those on all their product pages, like people happy with Basecamp or something like that. I, you know, that, that's, that makes it super personal. And they, they don't have to trust you. They trust the person who's using your product who likes it. So that's pretty key. Any other questions or anything before we wrap up? It's Georgia. I'm glad you asked us though, but go ahead, keep going. What are your, what research have you found on what's going on in Google? How do they do on Serifs? Okay, well that's what they say, but here's the deal. Serifs exist for one primary reason. It is to create a horizontal flow of text. It helps you read left to right. The serifs on body copy, they're pretty much all, they all kind of, create, like you see on the bottom of the, the line of text here, all the serifs are kind of forming a line, right? So that helps you determine, you know, creates a horizontal reading flow. It aids in reading. Long sections of copy should be printed in, in serif format, which is why almost every novel you'll ever read is a serif. I mean, that's, that's time tested over hundreds of years. They know it is easier to read that kind of thing in long sections of copy. Headlines, on the other hand, should be bold and sans serif. Um, there's no, there's no hard and fast rule there, but it's easy to read sans serifs in short bursts. It's very clear and distinct, so that it leaves no doubt. And then you want to do whatever you can to facilitate reading in your copy. So I defer to uh, serif fonts in my copy for that, for that primary reason. Also, I like how it's a little bit more luxurious and ornate looking. It seems a little more reputable to me. Jury's out on that one, though. Oh, I mean, like, you're asking what are some examples of other facilitators that people are using well? I mean, I think I pretty much touched on all the ones that I think that I've seen that, I, that look effective. Like, SEO Moz doing a great job. Look, they, they put 30-day money-back guarantee in red. Like, my eye sees that. Everything else is gray and kind of subdued. And then, uh, you know, they've got this special offer. They've got the VeriSign thing. Uh, Hacker Safe. You ever seen those logos? That's a good one. Some people are you know, paranoid about that. Uh, it's just little stuff like that. All you know, Company logos, those work great as, as you know, social proof. Um, here's some of these testimonials with pictures like we've seen. And they put the company logo, like they're hitting all the little facilitators there. You know, anything that looks, uh, makes you look important or look like somebody legit using your stuff, you want to do that. Anything else? We could be done. I think we're done. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>